Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and a very happy new year. If you have joined us before, welcome back. If you are new to the Fast Forward Series Masterclasses, welcome. It's good to have you with us. My name is Hopolang Ngaleleketa, and I'm the Executive Head of Marketing for Vodacom Business. So today we've got a very exciting session, and I've been seeing your chats. I saw you Bongani saying, Ziakala manje. Indeed, we're going to make this a fun one for all of us. Today we have Mr. Theo Baloyi of Batu, and I'm sure all of you from the chat I can see all of you know exactly who the man is, but in case you didn't know, in these Fast Forward Masterclass series sessions, we really try to make smart connections um, that help you connect the dots for yourself in your business, as well as connect you to other like-minded business owners, small business owners and entrepreneurs who can share their experiences and their lessons with you. And for today, the topic of the Masterclass is from dreaming about it, to owning it. And that's exactly what we're going to discuss with Theo, who I'm going to tell you a little bit about, even though I'm sure you know everything about him. I'm not sure if you guys are aware that Theo is actually an, a qualified accountant. From a, you know accounting to, to sneakers, I'm not sure, but Theo's gonna share why with us shortly. And he also worked for PwC South Africa, as well as in the Middle East, before becoming a full-time entrepreneur. Um, and Batu has been founded for almost now five years. It's been um, in the making and growing very swiftly for the past five years. And I'm sure Theo will share exactly how he made that happen as we as we go into it. Before I bring Theo on, I just want to facilitate those of you who are new to the masterclass sessions with the platform. As you see, there's a chat panel where we'd like you to engage with us and engage with each other, because this is a, about making those smart connections with each other as entrepreneurs as well. So feel free to, you know, to drop a little message about who you are, where you're from, what your business is about, and maybe some good partnerships can come from the session. And we also have a question um, panel. So if you've got questions, I see there are four or five already in there, put them in there and then the question that gets voted the most is the one that we will be asking to Theo. So without any further ado, let me bring on Theo. Hi, Theo, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. It's great to have you with us and thank you for making the time. I'm sure this year has kicked off with a bang for you. Um, but I think for, for, for us that don't know you as well as some of the, the people on the chat, Maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and who is this your guy? Hi, hi everyone. Um, again, before I start uh, telling about or uh, introducing myself, I just want to say thank you to um, the Vodacom for this amazing opportunity and for I'm, I'm quite excited to be on this platform. My name is Theo Baloi. I am the founder and CEO of Batu. Um, we are a business, a proudly South African sneaker business, and our vision is to build a shoe brand that Africans can proudly affiliate with. And right at the core of our mission, we want to reignite hope and create sustainable jobs. We started from humble beginnings in a room in Alexander Township about five years ago, and with the very same niche vision to build a shoe brand that Africans can partly affiliate with. And talking about reigniting hope and creating sustainable jobs, over the last five years, we've managed to build about 30 brick and mortar stores and employ about you know 300 plus people in the business. Wow, that, that's that's a growing business right there, Theo. And as as Hunze says here, can you tell us where is you from? Who are your people? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm a, I always say this, uh, I'm a product of a potential. If you look at my journey, you know, from where I come from to where I am and where I'm going, it's always been a series of opportunities. And we could say if I come and doing a masterclass or having this conversation is one of the opportunities that I don't take for granted. And I think that's who I am. You know, I come from humble beginnings in um, a village called Parke. It's about a few kilometers outside Hamaskral. And I matriculated, when I matriculated, I had, a, I think, a dream to become an accountant, you know. And like any other, I think, you know, um, coming from an ordinary South African family, we always come to the big city to chase dreams, you know. So when I came to Johannesburg because my parents could not afford to, for my accommodation there. However, I had 
means to raise money for my tuition. Then when I came here, I had to squash in um, with my uncle who lived in, in, in Alexander Township at the time. And I think that's where the entrepreneurial back, you know, bit me. That's where the husband bustle started. And oftentimes I'm known to be a guy who comes from Alexander because I think that's a township that really helped me action, you know, and, and, and help, you know, enable my dreams, you know. So um, so I come from uh, an, an, an humble beginning villages and I had to come to Johannesburg, like I said, like any ordinary kid to further my studies. Then I later, you know, um, had the privilege to be awarded a bazaar opportunities by uh, a foundation to Tomorrow Trust. Then later on, you know, graduated in Dr. Tam. I was quite fortunate in that regard that I, after graduating, I had a, an opportunity to get, to get into a graduate program with one of the top four accounting firms in the world, that being PwC. And not only then, you know, I had, had then after my graduate program being employed, you know, permanent, and I had worked for amazing leaders in the firm that really believed in me, that gave me great opportunities, either being on, you know, secondment opportunities or local project opportunities that allowed me to engage with great leaders from a client point of view. Then later on, went on to be at the three-year secondment in the Middle East, uh, Dubai, specializing in um, asset management, um, at the firm, you know, in, in the UAE and based in, in, in Dubai before starting part two. So I always say that I'm a series of opportunities because I was then given opportunity by my parents to afford me an education, then then, then later on being awarded, you know, a buzzer opportunity, being awarded, you know, um, an opportunity to work for a great firm. And with all of those series of opportunities, I put them together to start part two to afford others opportunities. Oh, fantastic. You know, um, I, I didn't realize you were a homeboy. I'm, I'm from Hamanskwa myself. And Kidibone, oh. <laughs> yeah, Kidibone Moroka here uh, on this chat says that she passes Pake village on her way home to Siave. So I think there's a lot of us here in, in this conversation, which is great to see. So glad to know yeah. that I have a homeboy in you. Um, you mentioned that you had great opportunities even getting secondment through, you know, PwC and you being an accountant. So help me understand exactly how you went from accountant in PwC, which you're right, is a fantastic firm, to going into Batu and sneakers. How, how did that Batu brand and that bridge actually come about? It's, it's a very good question. It's a little bit of a fascinating and head of kind of story because, um, you know, I've, I've, when I studied accounting um, and I lived in Alexandra, um, I, I used to sell perfumes door to door, you know, uh, in the streets of Alex. Um, and I think that's where the entrepreneurial bug beat me and I fell in love with entrepreneurship. However, I had this, you know, dream and the desire to become an accountant, which then later on I went to pursue that dream that exposed me to corporate. But, you know, in me, you know, in my core, I knew for sure that I want to be an entrepreneur at some point. You know, nonetheless, I used to buy a lot of sneakers when I was in Dubai. Um, I had a collection of valuable, you know, um, limited edition sneakers, you know, spending thousands and thousands of US dollars uh, at the time uh, on sneakers alone. Then there's a saying that says, if you are spending too much on it, um, then why not own it? You know, I had a you know, deep desire uh, and love for, for sneakers. And um, I almost like regarded myself as a sneakerhead, self-proclaimed sneakerhead. Um, and um, so because I love sneakers and, and I, I really I was really passionate about what it does. And there was a trend around uh, suits and sneakers at the time. Then when I came back home in um, either festive season holidays, or I'm just visiting home in Alexandra. I could see that a lot of our um, so, uh, my community at the time, people are unemployed, predominantly the youth. And oftentimes when you speak to them, you realize that it's not because they are lazy or anything. You realize that some of them, and when you listen to your stories, you realize that they, it's that some of them haven't received the opportunities that we've gotten over the years. Then I, I try to, I realize that there's a problem, you know, and I want to pay it forward because I've been awarded great opportunities. How do I then now award others opportunities to try to play my part? Because through the great mentorship and the leadership that I was under at the time, oftentimes when I went back and said, you know, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank you for everything else that you've done. My mentors often said, or my leaders often said, that we don't want anything from you, Theo. The only big ask that we've got is that pay it forward. So between my passion and trying to pay it forward, I started, you know, thinking that, okay, cool, I'm spending a lot of money on sneakers. There is actually a problem in my community of unemployed. People have lost hope and so forth. Why not just combine 
this passion that I've got for sneakers and, you know, at the same time, maybe try to solve the problem in my community. And that's how Batu came about. Hence, our mission is about creating sustainable jobs and reigniting home because we wanted to throw in some way through this passion of sneakers, create jobs and then reignite hope because people seem to have lost hope, you know, in, 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 in our community. Little do we know that five years later, we'll employ about 300 people through that same passion. So it was more of passion and, you know, the love of business that got me into sneakers. And when I did, when I started part, I did about 18 months of research and development. And one of the findings from that was that we actually don't have a sneaker brand that comes from Africa that can be benchmarked with all of those international footwear brands, you know, um, of this world. So for me, it didn't make sense because Africans consume so much of sneakers then why not start, you know, uh, a sneaker brand? And hence our vision speaks exactly to that, a vision to build a shoe brand that Africans can partly affiliate with. So to answer your question, it was a combination of passion and, it, and, and that desire to sort of pay it forward. Mm. Thanks for that, Bia. You know, in all the masterclass sessions we've hosted before, that word, passion, comes through a lot. And yeah. I, I understand that it takes a lot of passion to drive what you want and to stick to it, um, you know, especially in, in the economic climate that we find ourselves. And on, on the call and in the chat room with us right now, we have a lot of, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs um, who aspire to, to, to achieve what you achieved in five years. I mean, five years is not a long time. Can you share with us maybe some, any of your key learnings on, what you bought maybe from your experiences, um, you know, when you're in the Middle East and drive, and using this passion to fuel um, what you're doing now. Any key learnings that you want to share with us? I think, you know, um, my key learnings with my journey and what I want to share is that you first and foremost need to be authentic to your core as a person. That really helps a lot because you can be able to filter out different types of opportunities or, you know, um, platforms that come through as opportunities and be able to maximize, you know, maximizing one opportunity to the next, you know. Um, for me, one thing, when I look back on my journey, and I'll, I'll say this again, that I'm a product of opportunity because I had a series and, you know, um, different types of opportunities that came my way from small opportunities to big opportunities and being able to really, you know, look at, you know, a piece of work or piece of or a project, you know, or an engagement as an opportunity. An opportunity it sometimes can be an opportunity to learn. It can be an opportunity to be that can be commercialized. It can be an opportunity that can, you know, you know, bring an idea to life and then scale it. Or it can be an op opportunity to scale. But being able to know exactly how which opportunities to maximize for me was a key lesson. You know, and you can only do that if you are really authentic with your core, because if you're authentic to your core, you want you won't you won't you won't be able to be you won't be influenced easily by you know by the noise you won't be influenced easily by the social currency because you are true to who you are and you know exactly what you want to do i mean think about it this way you know for me i was at the middle east working for a great project four times what i was earning uh, in south africa at the time we worked for a great you know leadership in the middle east that you know afforded me opportunity not only to be in the middle east but to travel the world um, I was up for promotion, but I was authentic to who I was and my core and my purpose. As it, as it, what is it that I want to do? And I followed that. You know, walked into my partner's office, said I'm resigning, and they were like, "What are you gonna do?" And I'm like, "I'm gonna sell sneakers." And they were like, "What sneakers? Nike sneakers?" I'm like, "No, I'm gonna start my own sneaker brand." And you know, for, for, for them, it didn't make sense. To a lot of people, it didn't make sense. But because I knew who I was, I knew I listened to the inner core. I listened to the inner voice and I was just, I was authentic to my call. I, I followed that, you know? So that's where it all starts, you know? Um, and number two also, I think being able to build relations, you know, don't, don't bend bridges is very, very, very important, you know, in, in, I think in life, in business, to really maintain great relations. Just last year, I had the, Peter, uh, the CEO of PwC, Southern Africa, Michelle Machapa, and the PwC Africa CEO, Mr. Dian Sheng, will come into my office. You know, and we're talking business. A few years ago, these people were my bosses. But just this last year, you know, I hosted them in my office, you know, as a boss of, as, as my own boss, and we had a conversation. And there's no bridges bent, you know. Um, so it's very important to really know that. And going to the business side of things, I would say this is very important. You know, um, we have a lot of creatives 
in I think in Africa in Africa in the continent we have a lot of great talent in the continent. We have a lot of I think appetite for conversion in the continent. Hence we attract so much of foreign investment. But I think one thing that we lack as Africans is that you know we come up with all of these creative ideas or concepts, but we don't know how to commercialize you know those ideas. So it's very important to really understand the mechanics of your business, you know, how to put it together from the value chain, and how do you then go about commercializing those mechanics, you know, uh, and being able to scale it. That's very important. It's one thing to have a creative idea and a, and a cool concept, but one question, how are we commercializing you know, this and how are we adding growth and value to the bottom line? It's very important. So those are the, I think, basic principles that I would say, because you can't be a leader if you can't lead yourself, number two, and you can't get into business if you don't know what your business is about and, and what are the mechanics are about, you know? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the word authenticity is very important. And yeah. you mentioned with authenticity, knowing thyself, knowing your passion and knowing what you want to do has helped you prepare. Now, how difficult is it? Or have you had an instance where you've, cha- you've been challenged with partnering with certain people to to help you scale who don't meet you know your authentic self because i think authenticity goes with also the type of people you wish to partner and move forward and grow with you know how how has that journey been so i've got a mentor that i go about when it comes to partnerships or business you know um i buy into character and the person before skills you know um there's a saying that says people get hired for skill but they get for attitude you know so i buy into the character of the person whether it's a collaboration um whether it's a partnership whether you know um they're going to come work for party i buy into the character and their values before what they're capable of because skill can always be learned you know so i've had incidents when you know obviously i had to walk away from deals and great opportunities because they don't align to my values and oftentimes it's quite ironic. It goes back to what I said because I'm so authentic to my core. And I follow intuition in my decision making process, and I follow intuition when I exercise my business acumen as well. I've walked into deals that made sense and that that could have contributed a lot to our bottom line. And the team will go like, "I feel this is this is amazing. Why are you saying no to this?" You know, and I'll say, "I can't explain it now, but my intuition is off." You know, and I don't want to get into this because I don't think it's aligned to number one our values. I don't think it's aligned to our vision, and I think the craft is also off. You know, and trust me, tell you what, Kutulang, you know, kidding not. Um, a few weeks later, a few months later, or even a year later, you know, the very same project that we are about to get into goes into goes into fail, or you know, these things that are involved that are not completely, you know, uh, what we initially thought they were. You know, and something is off with the deal, and the team always comes back and says. No way, Phil, you must have known about this. You know, I'm like, no way, I just followed my intuition. So in everything else that I do, I try to partner with, you know, with people and align with values and character more than anything else. Mm-hmm. I just uh, want to just say, tell you, Theo, that the chat um, panel is on fire, okay? <laughs> so I just want to ask everyone who's posting in the chat panel, if you have a question, remember to post it under the questions tab and your other colleagues on the call can vote for the questions that they want us to, to pose to Theo. So please do pose those many questions about branding and about funding, all of that in the question panel. Theo, I wanna just pivot a little bit because as you know, Vodacom Business is a technology and communications company. And we really pride ourselves in giving you know, the right tools to small businesses that can help them grow especially during these challenging times, because um, technology has obviously proven, especially now through COVID, that it really can help businesses penetrate and access different markets and customers, regardless of where you are operating from. Um, so from from your experience, um, you having been an accountant by train and then moving into the Batu sneakers and then an online store, what was the thinking behind the retail side, then moving online. Because you could have just chilled and had a nice store and, you know, carried on. Yeah, right? yeah. And I think, you know, the story of Batu, um, to to some degree, it's a story of the right timing, you know, from um, starting or establishing the business to uh, growth, care, to scaling. You know, it's all about the timing. So when we started our business, 
the first two years of, of, of trade, we were literally a, a direct sales business, right? So we're sitting from the boot of Macau, selling directly from our warehouse, you know, we're delivering, we're using couriers, not even with, without even an optimized omni-channel, you know, end-to-end omni-channel. Then um, at that time, still, we had a lot of offers to come and build brick and mortar stores. You know, landlords um, approached us because, you know, the, the brand was obviously at, at, at peak in demand. People used to go to malls and say, where can I find Batu? So we had retailers approaching us, if, asking us if we can retail at their platforms in their stores. We had landlords approaching us saying they can give us, you know, space at retail, you know, um, and many others. But we opted not to do that because we wanted to boil our working capital you know, in the first two years and, and grow um, the, the value chain from then, and hence the growth post the two-year period. So um, when we went on to brick and mortar, we did very well in that space. Obviously, that's, the, 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 I think, the main core of our business. And we literally launched, I think, um, our online store at the right time, just before COVID, you know. And when COVID came and the pandemic came, uh, the global pandemic came, and it had obviously had a strain on the global economy, um, you know, South Africa, precise, to, to be precise, we were on lock, the, the hard lockdown for six weeks. Brick and mortar was a uh, brick and mortar store, so retail was was, was closed. Um, we had to now press a reset button, and that gave us an opportunity, um, you know, to optimize our omni channel, you know, uh, our online, and really make sure that it's well optimized and synchronized with our brick and mortar stores, you know. So it's a great episode, and so far, our online store over the last year has grown over by 200 and something, 200 plus percent year on year growth, you know, because that's where the consumers are moving to. But the beauty about Synergy and Time is that we build the two, I think, business units uh, simultaneously at the right time. So we did not become a big retail brand with 100 stores and a less optimized omni-channel. We became a, a store with 10 stores and had an opportunity to build an omni-channel and synchronize it with our brick and mortar stores. And we've seen great appetite from that. I mean, our online stores have engagement across the globe, predominantly in SEDEC, East and West Africa. And, you know, uh, you sometimes look at the omni-channel at the back end of it and you see people in Switzerland 2 o'clock in the morning or in the USA engaging with your side. So it's been a very great, I think, avenue for us and a, a, avenue, a revenue, avenue, um, revenue uh, I think, um, channel for us. And a, and a great a platform for us to exercise our brand, you know, optimization and amplifying our brand and engaging with different consumers across the globe. So it's been, I think technology has been, to answer your question, technology has been a great advantage to our business, you know, and earlier on you mentioned that five years is probably, um, you know, a, 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 a shorter period. But I think it, it looks like that because we are, as brands now, we engage with consumers differently, you know. And I, Omnichannel is one of the greatest platforms to engage with, you know, clients uh, across the globe. Whereas previously, you had to be, I don't know, it's very difficult for you to engage with someone who's on the other side of the, con- of, of the world. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, I'm so glad that you had the experience with technology because I know most entrepreneurs are quite fearful of engaging technology. And I, uh, and I believe just like you, Theo, that that's the only way you're going to have that scale um, because you can't unfortunately be everywhere every time. And by partnering with the right people who share the same vision and um, values as your business is the only way that you can really drive growth in your business. Um, as Vodacom Business, we have a suite of products, especially um, solutions for small businesses, our smart security solutions that help those who are venturing onto this online platform and trying to build omni-channels really make do so in a secure manner on a secure network. So I'm glad that that has really yielded results for you because definitely that is the way the future and business is going. So I want to just get into the questions because like I said, they're they're coming in fast and furious, Theo, um, so that I don't leave anybody out of this conversation. We have Mpeli Lelima who asks, did you have to enroll in any short courses or any form of formal learning prior to kickstarting your entrepreneurial journey? Not entirely. Um, Obviously, I, you know, again, going back to being a product of opportunity, I worked for a great organization um, that exposed me to different clientele, you know, that different mechanics, 
and also what we then had obviously uh, at the time you know we had a business school an internal business school that you could go obviously for different types of courses from soft to technical skills but you know um what really helped me a lot in terms of amplifying um my my my, my skills or my entrepreneurial skills was that I, I i ended up i worked in in consulting so and consulting for different clients you know one day you are you know uh, auditing vodacom you know the next day you are in a mining um you know we audit you consulting for a mining client the next day you are in you know um completely a retail business could be you know so it exposes you to different types of business models different types of working engagements different types of um projects and most importantly you get to study different business models and how again they commercialize how they scale what the strategy is and so forth so hence you know i could i was very much flexible to move from being an accountant to retail i've never worked in retail in my life i when i started business i did i've, I've never actually i didn't even understand what south african retail landscape is like but because the way my mindset was set up as a consultant is that you are flexible and you can engage and you can learn business models and you can come up with strategies for that. You know, that's, that's, that, that was my role at PwC. It was easy for me to jump from an ordinary uh, accounting consulting role to go to an industry that I know nothing about, study it, do my surveys and say, this is, I'm going to get into this, you know, uh, industry and this is, this would be my business model and this would be my USP and this is going to be my differentiator and this is what I want to communicate, you know, because I had ex I was exposed to that. You know, you go to a mining client, you know nothing about what they do. The piece of work is auditing. You know, it's asset management. The client wants to, you know, um, up minimize cost and maximize profit, and you need to tell them how to do it. But you don't understand. You're not an engineer. You know, so you need to be very flexible and adaptable and really understand what the business is about and advise them from finance point of view and say, you know, as a mining engineer, I think the shafts that we've got they're not optimized. So your processes are not efficient. So therefore, I think we need to sell this asset and then only recoup this once and maintain this once. And you can take the bulk of your revenue and invest it here so that you can maximize your profit, you know? So to answer the question is that I wasn't, I, I didn't do any entrepreneurship courses. However, I was exposed to an environment that exposed me to um, different business models, different mechanics that allowed me to be flexible in my approach. Fantastic, thanks for that, Nia. I have a follow-up question from Mpumelelo Kanile. Mpumelelo is asking, so balancing a nine-to-five job and a business. Uh, she's, that's what she's doing now. She's balancing a nine-to-five job and a business. And she would like to ask um, as to what stage of the business is it you know, advisable to transition to being a full-time entrepreneur? I think, these, again, it's, it's about, you know, um, being authentic to your core. I don't think there's a right stage to for you to jump. Obviously, we need to also be realistic about you being a human being and having a life to live and having expenses you know, to cater for, you know. But I think from, you know, from corporate is that you need to be able to be honest about your side hustles with your employer, depending, again, on the leadership that you serve. Again, for me, I serve the leadership that allowed me to be honest and to be transparent and, you know, disclose what I, what is it that I'm doing, you know, um, with my time on the side, you know. Uh, and what I did then is that obviously between nine to five, you know, after work, I would put in the work, weekends I would put in the work. But to answer your question, let me give you a simple example of myself. So for me, I did an analysis. So I, I literally went for, the, for PwC for five years and I saved my savings. So when I jumped ship, you know, I already did a sort of study or analysis as to my savings, how, how long will they sustain me, you know? And even though I was afforded a series of opportunities you know, uh, from, you know, South Africa to the Middle East, I never changed my lifestyle. So even when I quit, I never changed my lifestyle. You know, everything else was still maintained, you know, simultaneously across, you know, my life, you know. Um, and what I did is that I did my analysis and said, okay, cool, if I do jump ship now, you know, I will be able to survive for the next year without employment and I will be able to uh, obviously focus on this business and grow it. And if it grows, then great, you know what I mean? And again, if it doesn't grow, I had a great relationship with uh, my former, you know, um, employer that I can come back, you know, and work with them. So I don't really think it's, 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 there's the right time. You know, it's about the intuition in you and you would know when it's the right time. I went from South Africa, you know, from Christmas holidays, it was January the 18th. I went back to the Middle East. I went for that and the first day of work, we had a Teams meeting, 
you know, the, across the group and our partners are giving us, you know, obviously results and how, how the company did for the year and the plans for the year. Immediately after that, you know, um, I went to my partner's office and I was like, this is not me because my intuition spoke to me, you know, and I resigned there and then, you know. So um, whether that was the right time or not, in my case, it was. But do you have that intuition in you that says now is the right time you need to jump ship? I think you will only know when you have that inner voice telling you. Yeah, I think that inner voice is your conviction and your yeah. determination. Um, you know, you know when you are ready to give it your all and and risk it all for your business because that's what you want to be doing with your time. Um, I'm going to move on to our next question. We have a question from Kidiboni Moroge, our lady from Seabela there. Um, Seabe, I mean, she's asking, how do you deal with the negativity on social media? Ah, uh, man. And I think that's the thing is that, you know, I've got two, when it comes to my life, it's that um, I've got a, a philosophy that I live by. Number one, I don't spend time in the trophy room because, and that is why I don't have a big head, you know. I don't spend time in the glory room. That's why I don't have a big head, you know. And again, I don't spend time in a you know room of full of negativity i don't i don't really even give it a thought but i can take constructive criticism you know and constructive negativity if it's you know um directed to my growth or you know an area of improvement and so forth you know but i realized one thing that you know uh, I, I really you know there's a quote that i live by this is how i feel about it let me say this so it says it's no nonsense focus on what matters attain hate with love kill them with kindness and bury them with success that's how I <laughs> That's nice. That's a nice one. I'm gonna steal that actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have also um Gabelo Maqueta, who's clearly, you know, wishing you all the best for you and asking, when is Batu going for public listing? Has Batu do you have any plans for a public listing? Actually, I had a conversation with Mentor about this discussion the other day, you know, um, and I think there's different types of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs that are, um, you know, that are building for family business, entrepreneurs that are slowly building for, for wealth, you know, um, and so for me, I think, you know, we're still at the growth stage. Uh, I don't know when, when, when will that happen, but one day it's one of our visions as to, it's one of our, it's our vision to, to lease and become a global business, you know, and allow the public to be a part of our business. Um, but we don't know when that time is, to be honest. Mm. I, I, I see that <laughs> we have a potential, um, you know, Batu owner in the making, a potential Theo in the making in Peter Mamabolo, because Peter is asking, how does he start the foundation? He's also thinking of having a shoe brand. Uh, how does he start what? A foundation? A foundation of starting a shoe brand himself. Oh, okay, cool. Look, I mean, I think again, you know, you, you need to understand the, the 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 vision, you know, uh, and the mission of why you're doing it and the reason why you're doing it. Um, and there's different. I think now, the, the, in, especially in South Africa, we've sort of opened up the market. I think we've we've lost the earth for a minute there. Let's just wait for Theo to join us. And again, ladies and gentlemen, I see all your questions. Keep them coming. We will continue to make sure that Theo answers all of these. So please continue to post all your questions in the question pa panel. And please vote for the questions that you want us to answer. I think that's the most important thing. So the ones with the highest voting will be the ones that we ask to Theo and you can get a response. I'm just going to read some of the fantastic chat um, comments that you guys have been putting. Uh, Gediboni says, thank you, Theo. So Gediboni is appreciative of you answering. But I love what Nompilo Zungu is saying here. Nompilo, I'm just going to read your chat to everybody in case they missed it. The, um, Nompilo is saying, I love your Batu Care Foundation, where you donate school shoes for school kids. I would love to take along some time this year and donate some of our amazing products that we manufacture. We are a manufacturing company that's manufacturing soaps and detergents, and we would love to donate soap powder, fabric softener, um, bars of soap, laundry stain removers to school kids because they believe that cleanliness is fighting germs. So there's Nompilo 
you know, asking to partner with you and your foundation, which I also think is a beautiful thing that you're doing. You know, a business with purpose um, is really something that we should all be looking towards. I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead, Theo. Thank you so much. Sorry, um, is there two questions? Sorry, I had to. My connection yes, let me let me go back. Head. Let me go back to the question. I was just reading some of the the comments, which are fantastic, by the way. Um, the the next question that I was going to ask, um, after we we heard from Gabelo asking about how to start a shoe, um, you know, a shoe brand, is the next one from Clement Mashile. Do you have any plans um, in place to to use ordinary loyal customers to promote the brand or to create their own edition of the brand. I think Clement is talking about maybe something you did with like uh, Somizi or something. I don't know. Sure. 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 No, 100%. You know, I always say this, that there is no amount of um, advertising or marketing or influencing that can really advocate for a brand than your authentic customers you know like your you know uh, customers people that go into store and really advocate it because those are the true advocates of your brand you know uh because they bet it out of they bought it out of love you know they really spend money on it and they really you know believe in the brand so whenever they go out there and engage with um the audience whether they are in a circle of friends or circle of family and you know people are asking about the shoe they will advocate for your brand authentically and we have something called uh, the friends of party which will be doing something amazing with them you know um over over this year you know and then we do have you know programs where we uh, sort of go with uh, our clients and really add, help help basically engage with them and make and collaborate with them in many ways in many ways so this year we're gonna do a little bit more of that you know um, and then yeah so this is stay stay tuned in all our socials because we're going to engage with our consumers even more now Ah, that's great. I mean, Nompilo, there you go. And everybody, look out on the social platforms and handles from Batu and what they'll be doing with our friends of Batu. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, now, I'm going to just ask two more questions. Like I said, there's so many of them. Um, the Ritumeti Siko is asking, are there any plans to open Batu shoe stores internationally? Yeah, for sure. Like I've said earlier on, you know, we've got a great engagement and um, I think clients across the world, you know, uh, and this uh, this could be Africans living in other parts of the world. We've seen a great appetite in SEDEC region uh, that is especially or predominantly Botswana and Swaziland, um, you know, where we planning actually to, um, you know, try to amplify our brand further there. You know, we've got a great appetite as well in East and West Africa. You know, um, Kenya, you know, it's predominantly doing well for us as well. So, uh, in the Middle East as well. So, yeah, in the future, long term, we want to ob obviously get to um, brand presence there. We currently have that brand equity in those uh, part in other parts of the world. But it's a matter of how do we then con uh, convert that equity and that appetite into, um, you know, uh, commercializing it and into uh, existing brand then brick and mortar stores and so forth, you know. So we are working with our strategy team and our brand team to do so. Yeah. Uh, Ntoneng has a, what I think is a brilliant question. I think something that possibly has been on your mind many times as you've been growing in the last five years. Ntoneng is asking, what's the one risk affecting your business that bothers you the most? And do you ever worry about that risk and your business, if your business is over trading? She's also continuing to ask, are you taking more than you can handle given the current resources and market environment and if not what measures do you have in place to avoid that and she's just giving you a high five and saying great work as well <laughs> yes yes thank you so much for that i think that's a very very good question so you know um one of the things that we've done when we started we did a a, a risk analysis and risk methodology on retail like i've said earlier on that I've never worked in retail, so I had to really understand the dynamics and the mechanics of retail, you know, and one of the things that we've realized was that a counterfeit, you know, it's a huge risk for the nature of the business that we're in, you know. So therefore, we then came up with a, uh, a counterfeit methodology and how we're going to use that to amplify our brand, you know. So I think that is one of the big risks that really um, threatens our business. But at the same, at the same, at the same time, 
it could be very good for brand. And I know a lot of people probably think, how can counterfeit be good for brand? But sometimes counterfeit really gives you, and I've had this discussion with my mentors and my leaders, sometimes some they agree, some they disagree, but this is just my thought, that sometimes counterfeit can really be good for business, mainly because, you know, it gives an opportunity, it gives your consumers an opportunity to learn about your product, you know. It really gives your brand as well to advocate, you know, um, where to actually go and buy the authentic product, you know. It gives an opportunity also to uh, do a great event exercise around your product to say this is how you really spot an authentic battery and a counterfeit battery, you know. And also an opportunity to if you really have authentic clientele and clientele and that really support and advocate for your brand. We've had issues when uh, some of the people would go to, you know, the CBD and see battery counterfeit and they would tell the people sitting in the counterfeit that you can sell any other counterfeit but not this brand, you know what I mean? So it also goes, show, goes to show the brand loyalty, you know, that you have. But to answer the question, I think that is one big risk that not only for Bati, but threatens the entire retail, you know, uh, industry. And um, when it comes to, uh, I don't think we have taken too much, but I think the, 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 the thing about the size of our business and the growth is that because you're building so fast and rapidly, you need to sort of always have a very good, recruitment approach, number one, to make sure that you have the right people in the bus, and not only have the right people in the bus, but make sure that they're sitting in the right seat in the bus. And I think that's one thing that, you know, um, it, it, I think it's a big threat and, and can be, it, it can hinder you a lot and can really cause problems in the business if you are going rapidly and you have too much of staff complement, but you're not getting the return on, you know, um, of, of the return on investment on whatever that you're putting forth, you know. So we are a business that obviously we do a lot of analysis, we do a lot of research, and you know all our our decisions are informed. We make informed decisions based on the data that we receive, our uh, forecast that we plan, and we make sure that everything else that we do in the business is well informed. I think that you, you made a, a good point about making informed decisions, and this leads me to Temba Musia's question. Um, Temba is asking, instinct or advice? Which one is best to go with? Instinct. Any day, any day, any day, any day. Over mentorship, over expertise, over anything. Instinct. All the time, any day. Trust your gut, huh? Yep. So as, as I want to wrap up, Theo, um, you've shared with us how you came about starting this business, you know, your, your, your journey from PwC and all the leadership um, advice you also received and, and also nurtured um, those relationships to help you to get to where you are now. I just want you to maybe um, share with me your business philosophy. I know you've spoken about Motuke Motukabatu, but what is that business philosophy that grounds you and your business? I think I've mentioned it uh, before. I think uh, I'll try to match this too. So, um, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't spend time in a trophy room you know, at all because I believe that I am because of people. You know, our business, is, our business is supported by people. We are where we are because we come from humble beginnings in Alexander and because people supported us and we built the business that we built, you know. So I think that is one thing for me that I don't spend time in a trophy room. And number two, I think it would be, you know, I believe in, you know, profiling before diversification, you know, it's very important to really profile, to profile an idea, to profile an identity, to profile um, a business, you know, before you even think about diversifying, you know, I mean, um, you look at a, a business as big as Vodacom, you know, a lot of people, I know you guys have got different subsidiaries and different business units and different companies underneath and you're in different sectors as well, you know, but you, you look at the profile of how the business has been, uh, how it started and how it scaled and how it grew, you know. Um, it's very important to have that really profile because whether you want to tap into a new um, business unit, you want to start a new, you want to build into a new industry, you want to start a new collaboration, when you put the profile and identity, it really, it will really unlock the doors for you, you know. Um, and you can obviously use the, the lessons that you've learned from profiling and building that one business in multiple um you know, uh, business that you want to build or across the group when you diversify. So I always believe in profiling before you diversify. Mm. Uh, talking about profiling, I think it leads me to one of the co um, the comments that were posted. Um, I mean, I guess it's obvious, but I just we just all want to make sure, all 243 of us here want to make sure, why the name Batu? <laughs> 
Look, uh, I think so. The, um, so what inspired your name was that I was actually traveling uh, to Saudi Arabia, connecting via um, UAE, and I was at the duty free airport for about I had eight hour layover, eight hour layover for about you know uh, eight hours, uh, eight hours there, and I had an opportunity to engage with a, a guy who owned a retail store at the duty free section, and this guy was from France. And when I asked him about his brand, they were just basically selling, you know, different types of things for tourists, you know. Um, and when I engaged with him, I realized that his brand actually resonates with the French community, you know, um, and, and people from France, you know. And living in the Middle East, you know, you realize that the Emiratis are very, you know, um, I think, uh, patriotic about who they are. You know, they only fly Emirates, they're proud about Emirates, they're proud about who they are, nothing else, you know. And they really advocate, you know, um, Emirati stories and, and who and their identity, you know. And I realized that we as Africans we actually have so much heritage. You know, I mean South Africa alone has different ways of speaking, different ways of eating, eleven official languages. But it seems like we are not advocating that to the globe, you know, and as to who we are. And here's this beautiful wave that has existed in South Africa way prior democracy in the days of Sophia Town in referral to Ishu. And the beauty about this name is that South Africa is known to be, you know, a diversified country, our beautiful rainbow nation by Utah. But, you know, um, different ways of speaking, like I said, this way it passes, whether you're from Kuwait to Kuwait to Bloemfontein, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, so I'm like, why don't you just take it and conceptualize this as a brand and say, you know, this is a, a, a slang word and comes from South Africa and it unites us. You don't have to speak Zulu, Debele, Sotho, Tuana, Batuki Bat. That's it. <laughs> I like that. Batuki Batuka Nete. So <laughs> just as we close off, Theo, I really want to give you the last few minutes, uh, five minutes or so, just to share with our audience here. We, we've seen we've got aspiring entrepreneurs, aspiring shoe brand uh, manufacturers, already existing hygiene product manufacturers on this call. We've got a myriad of people joining us wanting to hear from you and what you've been through. And most importantly, I think, you know, any advice, you know, any top five, you know, tips, tricks, advice or learnings that you would like to leave them with. Let me give it to you to share that with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, number one, you know, your, your, I would advise a lot of people, and business is business in the day, but I think uh, for, for your sanity, for your own peace, or for your own happiness, it's very important to really, you know, get into business that really fuels the inner you. Um, some, if possible, that is purpose-driven, you know, because you... Whether times are favorable or unfavorable, you will be able to get up every morning and do it over and over again because of it's close to heart, you know? And you will be able to do it out of good will and good faith uh, on principle at all times. You know, when something is in you and you really want to make it a great success, it's not about, you know, um, uh, the money or anything else. You will be able to know which door to take, which one not to take. Because this thing is purpose-driven, it's rooted in your core, you know? But then again, business is business. If it's an idea, it's an idea, and then you think you be able to commercialize and scale it, uh, let it let it be, you know? Number two, I think I would say, you know, it doesn't matter where you start, whether you start in local or globally, but it's always very important to be intentional about your approach and build and start locally, but build for, you know, build for the global environment or for international in everything else that you do, whether it's cleaning products, whether it's telecommunications, whether it's a foodware brand, you know, don't always think the cabello next in the next street or the tepo in my neighbor or so forth. Think about the market in the USA, you know, think about, you know, um, a, a, a Munyarati in Zimbabwe and, and, and so forth. Think about it on a global scale and say, how do I make sure that this business, you know, actually scales? Number three, I think make sure that your business, you know, in some way sort of adds cool factor. It helps cool factor to, to, to your clients or it sort of helps your clients' lives better and you know, it increases efficiency and so forth. There gotta be that value add that someone looks at whether the product or service and goes, actually, you know, this is um, a, a great value add to my day-to-day -day living, you know? You really need to um, understand that, you know? And I think, you know, Number four, this is not even about business. In everything else that you do, you need to be able to be of service, of service to your community, of service to your your family, of service to 
you know, the people that are around you, you know, because Savile, Savile's, you know, results into excellence or Savile's produces excellence. And I always say this, you know, think about it this way. You go to a restaurant and the coffee is terrible, but the waiter is amazing, you know. The waiter is really, really, really amazing, you know. You often will come back to the restaurant because the service that you've gotten from the waiter is about service. Oftentimes, people think for you to be great uh, or for you to create an impact, you need to be a genius. Sometimes it's about doing the simplest things out of, with excellence and doing it over and over again, you know. And, and that's how excellence comes about, being able to have that intention to be of service. And the reason some of us were here because we are where we are today and you know we are we are blessed and we, we have great things because there was a point in time when we were off service to the companies that we worked for we were off service to the leaders that we reported under you know irrespective of whatever conditions or projects they're working on we woke up every morning went to work you know no ego no arrogance we went there to learn we went there to do our jobs but most importantly we went there to serve you know and hence you know um when we go and start our own businesses we want to serve communities we want to serve our people and we've got people working for the business that we've started out of savings as well so it's very important to be of service in um in everything else that you in everything else that you do so yeah, i just spoke a lot about this i had the fifth point now i forgot it and um <laughs> yeah it's passion that's why <laughs> yeah yeah and, and 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 just doing that but i think you know yeah closing off with that number four it's, it's just being of service in everything else that you do you know um mm -hmm. and being able to, to to be of service in, in, in everything else that you do. number five i would say just have fun you know you need to be able to have fun we live in an era where you know um the social currency you know they people do things so that they can train people do things so that they can be socially relevant or socially accepted you know, um, you know, you need to be able to just be authentic to who you are and do your thing, you know, because tell you what, you know, five years later, people will never remember who was the popular influencer, you know, who was, who once chanted on this topic. But when you're of service and you're really rooted to your core, people will always remember the work that you've done and the impact that you've created. I always say this, God forbid, but to close this down, you know, uh, and with 300 employees and you fire everyone else, or maybe you retrench everyone else because the company is closing down. People will never forget what you've done in the five-year tenure that we've traded. You know, the impact that we've created in the communities that we traded in, you know, the lives that we've changed. And it's about being of service more than anything else. So mm -hmm. forget about the two minutes models and being socially current and trying to, you know, um, fit in. You know, just be honest with, who you, with yourself and have fun. Thank you so much for that, Theo. I think what you've just shared with us now really demonstrates what our philosophy is as Vodacom Business, that, you know, with... Um, technology and innovation and innovative technology and digital solutions from partners like us as Vodacom Business, combined with entrepreneurs and business owners like yourself and the passion that you have for your business, that's what's going to take this country further, you know? Um, and thank you so much for your time. I just want to share with our guests on the call that we really appreciate your time with us and all the questions and being so engaged in this conversation. Your story is indeed inspiring. And if you could also join us for the next Masterclass series class, that will be on how to do business in a digital economy. And I think that kind of speaks also to some of the learnings Theo spoke about, about how the online store opened so much more revenue and, and revenue streams for him across the globe. So join in that in that session, the next masterclass, doing business in a digital economy. And as for Vodacom Business, we really understand that going online brings many opportunities for, for you as a small business to grow and succeed, but it can be a bit daunting and it can also expose you to some cyber attacks, especially when you're vulnerable and starting off. But with our smart marketing and, and security solutions from Vodacom Business, you can now protect your business's intelligence, data, devices, and preventing unauthorized access to that data because data is key as you move forward with your business, something that you all need to remember as you grow. But to close off, thank you so much for joining us. Please do register for the next session at um, our Vodacom Business website. You can find the URL in the chat. I'm sure somebody will post it in the chat, but it's vodacombusiness.co.za. Or alternatively, you can visit um, or search for Fast Forward Series, um, Vodacom Business 
fast forward series. Um, we'll see you guys soon. And thank you again for sharing everything that you shared with us, Theo. It was fantastic to have you with us. And thank you all for joining. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.